shone bright on the earth one night as I traveled all alone. Searching for an empty nest that I could call my home. Justina with a smile he proudly said 
This is my wife, this is my place, please come again. Oh, Dominica, Dominica, you are beautiful to me. On the island, Dominica, you are free. Oh, Dominica, Dominica, you are beautiful to me. On the island, Dominica, you are free. So the Torah also helps us kind of to know the mind of Christ better. And the first step to becoming more holy is understanding how Christ became perfect. There's there's mandates in heaven and there's mandates in earth. And Christ always said it is written because he knew that everything in heaven reflected what was done on earth and vice versa. So how would the elect bring the rest of the world to the sanctity in heaven if we don't even try to know the meaning and seek for all of God's word? If we're just taking a little portion, that's not going to cut it. The Torah was meant to, to start us off in life, to make a path for us, and then be completed in the millennial reign. So Christ was the one who came here, showed us how to do it, and then went to the belly of the earth, went back to home, and then was gracious enough to leave the door open and the light on for us. He's like the, a mega superhero. So there's also ordinances in heaven, and those allow us, and will allow us, I think, in the future to leave this world behind, to put on new garments that we won't defile anymore, because we'll know better, and we'll know how not to defile them once we know the full word and the law, and how to walk more rightly with God, because God actually walked with man at once, and walked with him in the garden. So in my eyes, I think the Torah is the tree of life that brings us back to the garden. So God will walk with us again, and we can have his presence again. So there's great work to do that's going to bring the world back there. So the Torah prepares us to look to the Father and to keep our attention and our eyes on him. And... not just to do a good work and to say that your deeds are going to get you into heaven. It's great to do good works, but that's not really the point because you look at the Illuminati and they have a whole bunch of charities as their fronts and they know that they need to do this because that creates kind of a balance of all their bad deeds that they do. But that's not going to bring them salvation and bring them eternal assurance in the next life. It's just fleeting and partial so the tithing that Christians do and then re just throwing out the whole rest of the Torah is simply just picking and choosing what you want when really the tithing was just presented so that the Levites could have a share with the other tribes and God talks about this in scriptures, saying that the people are not upholding his ways, they're stumbling, and they're falling into partiality. When the word kohen means to draw near, which he wants our complete selves and a sacrifice that comes from the heart. Some examples of how the, the elders of the Jews were trying to show, and be an example for the rest of the world by specifically following God's commandments from Abraham is in Luke 4.16 and in John 4.22. So the prophecies that are going to be fulfilled in Jerusalem are going to be very deceptive in nature because people that don't understand Zionism and Judaism and all the history that's gone on there aren't going to understand that um, when Yom Kippur happens and the sacrifice of the red heifers, that that's a prelude to the very end itself. Now there's an angel in Revelation that had authority over the altar. He had authority over fire from the altar of heaven. Now this is probably Michael. It's called Tum Mahavet, Korbanot, an offering, Peradma of the red heifer. 
this is a ritual about the impurity of the dead, how people will come into contact with the dead, the choke of Torah it was called, and they need to be purified, the par bull means the red bull, and so far only nine have been gathered. So in this prophecy there needs to be a tenth one, and that would be the sign of the redemption. So the first red heifer was done by Moses and Isaac on Mount Moriah, and then there was um, the stem plague warning that uh, was an altar on the threshing floor, and the second one was done by Ezra in the place of resurrection and non-resurrection, the threshing floor of Arona it was called, and then seven others were offered at the destruction of the second temple by Simon the Just, Yochanan, El Yochanai ben Hekoff, Kanamiel, Hamitzrai, and Yishmael ben Piavi. So when this future red heifer sacrifice happens, that will be the ushering in of the Messianic dispensation. But the ones who do not have the authority to do it are the Jews that are going to be trying to do it without a temple. And this tenth red heifer will be the one that's I believe will be prepared by the Messiah himself. And this red heifer has to be offered in perfection, red to the hooves, to the face, everything about it has to be perfect. It has to be born naturally. And so far, every three years, there's been one arriving. 2014 in America, 2017, one was born in Mexico, and in 2020 should be the next natural one. Now what they're trying to do, the Zionists, is create on the Temple Mount, they're trying, they're importing frozen embryos and trying to create their own non-naturally born perfect red heifer. And so far all have turned out to be red bulls. Now, First Chronicles 21 talks about the site where Jerusalem was built, where these red heifer sacrifices took place, and the fire from heaven and the altar and people being counted in Zion that shouldn't be, which is the same thing that's going to happen. And a plague comes and there's three days that are not good for these people that have to deal with the sword of Jehovah coming down. So the red heifer also represents a bridge that was that led from the Temple Mount to the Mount of Olives. And then it overlooks the east and the inner east gate. And Yeshua's foot, it says, will step back onto the Mount of Olives. Where he was killed, he'll come back to the place and return, too. So it's like a full circle. So Yeshua represented this sacrifice. He represented the Passover sacrifice. But he's described as a, kind of like a Nasi, like a prince of the tribes, and not as a high priest that will be doing this, this sacrifice. Um, in Hebrews, it talks about the sons of Zadok and this whole ritual and how they'll lead us back to a land, a new temple. And But this will be an offering for an individual, not for a corporate body, which some of the sacrifices in Israel were for the corporate body. This will be an atonement offering in Israel. And Paul talks about it as more an individual sacrifice, his sacrifice. And that dumbfounded other people because they didn't know what he was talking about. So another reason why I think this is yet to happen is that Christ said that he would give us a crown of beauty instead of ashes. And ashes were used in this particular ritual after it was commenced. And an oil of gladness, which has to do with Mount Olives and rejoicing. And our mourning will go away. He'll wipe every tear away. We'll trade in our garments and we'll have praise instead of despair. So the ashes were used for ritual consecration, the very end of something. And they needed living spring water and rain water, and Christ himself is the living water, he said. He's the bread of life and the water. Blood's also burned in this offering, and the entire body of the animal is consumed by fire. And that represents the consumption of sin and sinners and its finality. So we will, in this ritual, be washed by the water of the word. Yahweh's word made flesh and manifest in Yeshua, his only begotten son.
So the red heifer ritual was also done outside of the city, and Christ suffered outside of the city and the established order of things, which was 2,000 cubits away, and then the red heifer came back 2,000 years later. So it's another correlation. And this place was a place where things were purified, where um, Stefan, Stefan was stoned to death for picking up sticks, and where the ashes were burnt. This is a place where lepers went too, so it represents spiritual leprosy being cleansed and consecrated at the very end of the ages. Everything physical, you know, has a pre-existent spiritual meaning and manifestation before it. So the tabernacles represent heavenly tabernacles and earthly tabernacles too. There is cedar wood used, uh, Roman, the Roman cross was used that was, I believe, a seed that Adam had planted from the tree of life, which is why the Bible also says tree instead of cross. So outside of this camp of heaven, hyssop was used. In Matthew 27, it talks about the bitter gall and how they put a sponge to Yeshua's mouth, which was actually not water, but vinegar, put on a reed. And that's why he didn't drink it, because he knew what it represented. Um, that was used in Egypt, too, to keep the firstborns from death, since Israel missed their second Passover. Scarlet material was used in this ritual, which is also in Matthew 27. They put Yeshua in a scarlet robe, and then in Revelations, he's in a red robe. So red and scarlet were used in the red heifer sacrifice. And when Stephen was stoned, I know I'm digressing, but he he was stoned for picking up sticks, and those sticks also have a significance with this ritual because he the sticks represent the two sticks and the unifying the house of Israel and the house of David. And they you also represent this when you put two loaves of bread on a Sabbath before you have the meal, and that represents the two houses. So back to the scarlet robe, the red robe that Yeshua is presented in. The red robe will mean the battle. Um, the red heifer initiating that, where the horse bridles will be so high with blood, representing red too, outside this place. It says in Revelations, when it talks about the horse bridles without the city, which means outside of the city in this place. That was outside of the city gates. So this final offering, I believe, will cancel sin and death in its finality, ushering in the last dispensation, the red heifer, representing Yeshua's blood, perfect from head to toe, without blemish. And it also represents the redness of the heifer being the blood of Yeshua's enemies. And the offering will be done alone by Yeshua himself, that he will perform and... They always saved the ashes for fu the future for some reason with this ritual. So that also represents kind of his sacrifices being laid up in heaven. How it says the story of treasures up in heaven. And it also kind of represents the gospel hanging on a cross for this race. And how we will have an inexhaustible fountain, which is Yeshua, that we can have access to. And this ritual will be for the purging of our conscience. And the water from the vessel will become the vessel. If Yeshua represents the water of life, he'll become the vessel, because you needed a perfect vessel for this ritual, too. And on the third and seventh day, seven times sprinkled around, and three and seven always followed Yeshua in the scriptures. So, going back to the angel that had the authority of fire from the altar of heaven... The only time that fire rains down from heaven is in God's wrath. So something is going to trigger this. And this is a mirroring of an altar in heaven and some altar that's happening down on earth. So that angel is being loosed in the future. And I think this may be when the Jews start doing this ritual on an altar without a temple. They have no authority to do even... 
in uh, Ezra 326, it says the Jews, about the Jews, that there will be a wrath of God that comes down from the altar of heaven with ministers of fire. And what's also interesting about this ritual is that something about the bull and how people in those olden days were starting to write commandments on animal skins and one of them was a bull skin and then the Vatican how they started and created Islam which is Gnosticism masquerading as Christianity I mean Catholicism is Islam is something different but they also wrote their own laws which were the laws of man that replaced God's laws and how he set himself up as a representative uh, of Christ on earth and then he started the Pope started making these papal bulls so I know they counterfeit and they copycat everything so I think this also has to do with the red heifer sacrifice and in the World Bank we're registered um, when we come in to this world and our birth certificates and how they're registered as dead we're registered as dead then how we come into this world so I know that they do rituals in their black robes as the Bible says these people that he despises do rituals in their long robes and they do these rituals over papal bulls which they're kind of like soul collectors agents of Hasatan of course and so they kind of took and canceled out Adam's sovereignty as the first king of earth and they kind of they replaced it as their own with a beast system the seven churches to me represent the seven divisions of blood types not the Pleiades so much and there's a lot of links on the Garden of Truth and Lies that reference this the luminaries I think are heavenly hosts orders of angels because that's pretty much what the scriptures lay out and they'll fall like figs from a tree literally so going back to the red heifer this prophecy is going to be fulfilled kind of like the white buffalo that the Native Americans were looking for and how that started to happen and so now we're seeing this red heifer being born and the black snake prophecy being fulfilled and I know when God killed people in the Bible for the strange fire that they presented it had to do something with the ashes because everything in his mind has to be done a certain way and they were doing something wrong and lying to God and then presenting him with strange fire but I know it was something about the ashes so this is kind of a prelude to this fire spiritual retribution and consolation because um, even though your name is written in the book of life it can be blotted out and the Bible clearly states that so they offered incense that was offensive to heaven which is going to happen again I believe in Jerusalem and this could be the genetically altered imperfect sacrifice that's really not born of nature in a, a natural farm that it has to be born at our iniquity isn't purged from us until our spiritual death so that's another reason why I think this sacrifice has to happen and fire is sacred and it's uh, the intention of the earthly fire that has to match that of the of God to be pleased with it things on earth have to be matched with things in heaven and that's the whole reason for the building of the temple because God can't be literally in the presence of sin he can only meet us and a percentage of himself if we go about it rightly and in Matthew 12 6 it says I tell you something greater than the temple is here which represented Yeshua in Acts 17 24 it says God doesn't dwell in temples made by man in Revelations 21 22 it says I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord Almighty and the Lamb So I think they're going to try to do the sacrifice without a temple or with an unauthorized, unholy temple. Yom Kippur, it talks about in the scriptures as having something to do with a gold censer in the Holy of Holies, a returning angel 
that's doing priestly duties, but not in an earthly temple. He's, this angel is doing the priestly duties in the heavenly tabernacle. And this dispensational age will go way beyond edifying the body. And if you don't understand the oracles of God, you won't understand Yeshua as the Melchizedek. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, is kind of written like a letter, and it's very misinterpreted. The temple of the Ruach is the earthly temple. There's a heavenly temple, our body temple, a trinity of three, the number three, Christ being raised in three days, and he said, you can destroy this body, but I will raise it up again. And I think he was also, he was talking about his own body, because he never really mentioned a third temple. So in 2 Peter 2.5, he talks about your living stones built up in a spirit, a house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. Ephesians 2.21 talks about being whole and the whole structure being joined together that grows in the holy temple of God. Now we know that there's a third temple being built. There's already a universal global church in South America. Um... Possibly one going to be built in Israel. Then the Mormons have their own version of it in Jackson City, Missouri, called Adam on Yaman, which I think will be welcoming um, the Nephilim, the Nephi theology, the cosmology that links them to the Anunnaki and their ceilings. And um, the Nephilim is also where the gauging came from, I believe. But something with this future temple. Um, something that people don't really understand about the temple and the temple wall in Jerusalem and the ones that is kind of like a political rite of passage was actually put there in like 1960 and like uh, less than 200 houses were torn down and it's not even, it wasn't even part of the temple wall it was part of Fort Antionis and some of it from the temple of Apollo so I think that's another reason why they're building the Arches of Baal. Apollo is also connected to a story of a red bull, ironically. Dagon represents maritime law, citizenship, the Pope. And that one... The only wall that was left in that city was nowhere near the temple, but it was a city wall, and the Bible clearly said there's not one stone left to stand upon the other. So what we have there now is a gold lion's gate that has a Greek stone there, and gold calf imagery that also relates to the ashes and white atomic, monatomic gold. Fire is mentioned a lot in the book of Daniel. And all this ties together because there's nothing old about the Old Testament. It's like a whole, all of the scriptures. And the Old Testament's just as important as the New Testament when you see it as a whole. So these Jews over there are waiting for their Messiah to come still as a branch to build this temple when Yeshua is the temple himself. And the branch is actually us, the offspring to be used for the healing of all nations. Now, I can't even imagine the ramifications of a false messiah trying to take Christ's last rite and claim on this earth that he overcame when he overcame death and the prince of this world. When he rules in this realm, so if this imperfect offering is going to be tried and people are going to try God again. It'll be done out of fear, maybe because something big is going to happen in Israel and they'll think they have to do this red heifer sacrifice soon. You know, I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but the fake Jews that are there, they're going to this wall right now and they're mourning a tire and they're reenacting almost a weeping for Tammuz because it's like a pagan wall that's used as a political rite of passage by the Illuminati and uh, presentable members and they're devining, they're thrusting back and forth and speaking things into the cracks like in a perversion almost like an erotic union that's a Kabbalistic counterfeit and a blasphemy of the Bride of Christ 
And what this is doing is kind of creating a union of the Ain Sof, the Shekinah, Asherah, female goddess. So I believe that Christ is going to come with the truth. That'll be a sword that will cut through everything and starting out with Israel. The sword's going to come out of his mouth, which is his word. And that will bring a truth that will pierce to everyone's very soul. And it will be the dividing of the spirit and the soul. And this dividing is in the gathering and the sorting out in Sheol, where the root of the tree of life is, it says, which is in the face of the deep. The Bible names these places. We just haven't had it revealed to us until now to, to be brought up to the conscious surface of our minds. The Trinity is the mind, body, and spirit where we will one day see God face to face again with a higher Trinity aspect of ourselves once we understand the metaphysical within ourselves, which is not the Godhead, but Elohim. Christ's body being the fullness of the Elohim, where the Godhead dwelled on this earth that was brought from heaven to earth. The temple of his tabernacle and the testimony that was removed for us and the fulfillment of the gift of the Holy Torah can then be revealed to us at that time because it says we will stand in the presence of the tabernacle of his testimony, which is in heaven currently. So I still think there's going to be a false ascension and a counterfeit form of the tribulation saints who will ensure their place in the resurrection of spirit but flesh rises from the ashes. The skeleton army that is also in the scriptures has to do with us understanding the Torah itself too because the bones, the 613 bones, the 613 commandments of the Torah, the counterfeit form of it is the phoenix, the cult rising, the Luciferian false ascension. This is a metaphysical thing that happens that the scripture says will make our bones sing. This army of skeletons it's a also an act of consecration and putting things to rest when we know the power of the fire of God that fiery spirit made manifest in us the word was God the word was with God so we're in a time right now where Hasatan has deceived the whole world through all his agencies and then he's also convinced the elect that God's word was thrown out and that cheats us out of the resurrection because people really believe that Yeshua did everything so we don't need to do anything, not even to look and remember the Torah, the tea, the towel, the bowl, where Jesus said, follow me. His sins were nailed to the cross to bypass death, but not the word. That's what people need to understand. It didn't just end there. The greatest work is still yet to be done, and it will be done in the millennial reign. And if we're not in the body of Christ, we're not going to be part of that. So you need to understand what the body of Christ is. The curse was nailed to the cross, not the law, just the curse. Yeshua showed us that he ate fish when he resurrected and came back, and that I think he did that too to show us that he'll eat with us again during the feast, because the feast will be ongoing in the millennium the millennial reign. And he also appeared in a different form, which I think represented more of his heavenly form than the human form he took on when he incarnated here, because he appeared at several different times to people, but one other time he was in a different form than what they had ever seen. So the end times are going to be pretty exciting, and the seven churches coming together. Zephaniah 3.9 talks about this and how there will be one pure speech again, the Adamic speech. Um, that's when our genetics will be healed. We can't do it ourselves right now and go to some false ascension protocols. So when we're born again, we're born again of spirit. When Christ was born, he came here and was pierced for our transgression. His side was pierced. And this reflects how the word pierces our soul and spirit. How water gushed out from his side represents 
Also, in another part of the scriptures, how Christ said that water will pour out of us, living water, out of our bellies. How we'll be able to create with him. We're not gods yet. We don't do it now. Only through him and with him will we do that. The sea also represents life and death, and it's kind of like a membrane. Our spinal fluid that surrounds our brains. Everything about his body was precious, and if we try to understand his body and what he went through, then we understand what our bodies can go through. You know, they put the crown of thorns on his head, and one of those nerves that I think one of those thorns pierced through causes a aneurysm. I mean, he went through not only being beaten to an inch of his life, but through all that, and then died of a broken heart because of the weight of our sins that crushed him. Prior to that, being beaten, his stripes for us, for our transgressions. If people really hate the face of God that much to beat it to an unrecognizable form, then no, I do not believe the human family deserves to live. And we need to follow the plan of redemption that was laid out for us out of love, out of mercy, and out of grace from the Father himself. It also talks about in the millennium we'll have new offspring. The water, the word creates, flows out of our bellies. The hara center is in our bellies where our chi comes from. Now the Nephilim had their own babies and split women's stomachs in half, I think, back in the day. And Mark sixteen twelve talks about Jesus taking on that other form. Maybe it was his pre-existent form. Also in First Enoch, one twenty-two, there's uh, talks about fire and um, how the ocean will become ice, and the saints will walk across it. I think that's when we'll see the ocean, the sea of glass and fire. And the occult also steals the symbolism with fire and ice. You know, they always have a face coming out of the abyss and out of the depth. Enoch also talks about a lake of fire being a sea. And it says the redeemed will walk over it. So if you're not redeemed, you stay down in Shoal. Your soul does. And then after this, I think, in the millennial reign, we'll keep the feasts, we'll keep the new moons, we'll go back to God's calendar. Things will be put back in, the, in place the way that they were supposed to. Hebrews 10.13 talks about a waiting period and how the Lord's enemies will become his footstool and he'll sanctify and perfect all the beings that are being sanctified in this ongoing work. The work that Christ did for three days in the belly of the earth is the inheritance of the kingdom that he wishes to share with us the kingdom of heaven within, that's inherent within us. Now there's a difference between loving the Father and loving the idea of the Father. One will multiply the land and one will diminish it. Because anybody who really doesn't fear the Lord doesn't have his wisdom, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I think we need to let Christ's mission of continually completing creation from the mouth of the Father, allow us to seek that fulfillment which can only be attained in our Lord Yeshua. And when we recognize that, we can let that reverberation of His voice be, we can hear it, because He says, my people know my voice and will hear me. So we'll recognize His voice when He speaks to us and through other people. And then when we don't recognize His signature, we'll ignore it. Now, a feast that Yeshua did complete was the first fruits. He was the offering of the grain, he was the bread of life offering, and the first fruits of the resurrection. Since the word's the highest authority, Christ was the word made flesh and fulfilled the preaching of the law, and then he corrected the wrongdoings of the Pharisaical and Sadducee 
interpretation of the law. That's all he did. When we say fulfilled, we don't mean to be done with or put away. He just fulfilled preaching the law. I'm fulfilled by a lot of things, like a meal, but it doesn't mean I'll never eat again. So Christ is our high priest now. And in the day of trumpets, the horn will sound. The Feast of Tabernacles is still yet to happen, which will be the wedding feast where he comes back for his bride, a spotless bride. And this will be the atonement for Israel. And at that time, the nations can be judged. His people found guiltless, spotless. The Bible says, my people perish from a lack of knowledge. So those who won't make it there will, won't make it there because they don't understand the knowledge that will bring us there, which is the Torah. Yeshua gave himself up for us so that we can give up our whole selves as a free will offering. He was the bread of life, like I said. He was the grain offering. We're supposed to do, well, he reconciles us back to heaven and back to the Father. We're supposed to now do spiritual sacrifices and physical sacrifices. That's our storehouse for our treasures in heaven. Now there's, and we're kind of going to be like ambassadors because we're witnesses in heaven and on earth. And we're in the second covenant. The Torah is written in our hearts. And God says, let my law be the apple of your eye. So let our eye become whole is what that's all about. Not all flesh is of the same flesh. So that talks about our glorified bodies, I think. And his will is still being spoken into the earth. Christ is still resurrecting in a sense because he's resurrecting us right now. And when the, I talked about the skeleton army that's rising up, that's proof in itself of the mending of our joints and our sinews, how the body of Christ needs to heal in order for the millennial reign to be ushered in. God wanting to abide in us and bring up our valley of dry bones. The resurrected skeleton army out of death into life. Torah representing us standing upright and righteous before God the way he designed us to be. So we're also the salt of the earth. And the counterfeit version of that is how witches use salt and how they use to keep things out with salt that don't have the salt. Hebrews 9.23 talks about the copies of true things. Paul talks about this a lot and says to look for the shadow of things to come. Things that need to take place, he was talking about. Yeshua represented the red heifer, the body of the living temple on earth, being the king of Jerusalem. The way into the holy place hasn't been opened yet. So that promise, that purification of the flesh, the millennial reign, will bring the world into the covenant, the new covenant that started at Yeshua's death. And he shed the blood that purifies the heavenly things because the Bible clearly states that the blood of the goats and bulls never took away sin. It only purified the body. So you have to understand the difference in the, the point of all these rituals and what God wanted and expected from them, and what they meant. And it was to prepare us for the millennial reign. And Hasatan doesn't want people to understand the Torah because it leads to the inner mysteries. And there's layers of the Torah. And this... Torah will lead us into Revelation, the end of the ages. Hashem will take the sins of the fleshly, earthly tabernacle, the shadow, which is the shadow of the heavenly tabernacle, and purify our conscience. And that's why he also represented domes and tents, the Sukkoth booths, how he wanted us to prepare to meet him in these appointments in our tents, and how we're going to be out in the wilderness again, coming back to him. The temple... In Jerusalem also had a dome and a tent over it, but that's not presented in history. So the tents, the domes, the marriage covenant that's about to take place, that'll be established, but the promises are yet to be performed. He'll be our God. He says, I will be your Elohim and you will be my people again. There's things ordained that come from heaven's decree and the courts 
and they have to be enacted through the will and come to fruition in a way that will join heaven and earth. Now, this parable of the valley of dry bones, like I said, will join every bone and sinew. The physical and spiritual is allowed to step up to God's plate and his place of dwelling on his high mountain. So grace and lawless Christianity isn't like a limbo stick that you can just go under and say, oh, I got it. And at some point you fall under the statutes and measures to become like the, our creator. It's beyond edifying of the body. Grace is just one attribution to the personage of the Godhead, but it's not the only means out of which Elohim receives us. The new Jerusalem, the new earth, the new kingdom will be living lamps of Hashem, and it will receive the fulfillment of the promise. We'll have our reward there. Hebrews 9 talks about the way into this holy place not yet being opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is this present age. So we need to perfect the conscience of the worshiper that was laid from the foundation to commence the end of the ages. The New World Order is going incongruence and everything against this to try to deceive people in not having this millennial reward. They're even calling this generation the millennials. Now, the gospel shouldn't be subtracted or added to the law should not have that happen to it, but this didn't happen by reading the other scrolls, the 80 books that were turned into the 66 books in the Council of Nicaea. What we had happen was Judaism and Christianity splitting off into gross constituents of the whole law and a chasm between lawless Christianity and rabbinical Judaism with both are wrong as another Hegelian dialect when those are the only two choices. The Holy Spirit's pure, and it'll make our heart pure. It'll make our intellect pure. It'll give us pure direction, and it will be the compass that we need, and it won't lead you astray. So when we accept Him, when we connect with Him, and let Him lead us by the hand, even if needed, Hasatan won't have authority over us anymore. Hasatan likes to render us useless to the kingdom because and be a tool in God's hands because he's useless. He's useless to the heavenly thrones, so he seeks the throne on earth to steal until the title deeds are fully restored back to Yeshua and his kingdom. So he'll attack all our weak points, keep us even in the smallest lie that'll lead us to a bigger bondage. And after we're in bondage for a while, he'll gain access to our conscious and be able to constantly accuse us because he's called the accuser so there's a dilemma of not hearing that still small voice of reason but in our density that's the state of man we're listening to the wrong drummer so Hasatan obsesses and my friend Brett Christopher said this that his greatest weakness is actually the 24-7 collecting of souls so he kind of, Hasatan will kind of dial you in like catching a wave. And when you don't have Yeshua's covering and blood applied to you properly, then that's what happens. Proverbs 10.23 says, A prudent man foreseeth all evil. Doing wickedness is like sport to a fool, and so is wisdom to a man of understanding. So it's very important in this spiritual warfare to render Hasatan mute because the demonic realm and even satanic computer databases are always communicating with each other and plotting even to the point where they speak backwards and they profane the word and they do it also with back masking and music and blasphemous things. And then look for the algorithms that aren't responsive to their frequencies and to their attacks. So you want to be the anomaly. And you do that by putting on the armor of God. And I know our words create our reality, and they stem from the desires in our hearts. A split tongue is a divided mind, which is enmity against God. So if you constantly keep something divided, you're going to have enmity with the Creator, not be at peace with Him, and have a peaceful mind to be able to see things in field vision for what they are, and to realign you. 
and since time memorial, religions have always been an enemy to God. And the great deceiver comes still as an angel of light, and his servants as servants of light. I just ask for intuition to be as real as I can be, to see things for what they are. I don't hate people. I have compassion for people. I love people, but a lot of these so-called super soldiers and people on the truth scene that keep coming out of the woodwork, you can tell they're doing it for attention. Their motives aren't right. I have no time for, for stuff like that or people that just need to make a name for themselves, like some TV evangelist or something. They obsess about predatory darkness and AI and what they think the construct of this world is and their two cents. And what that's doing is actually drawing them farther out of reality. And then they become delusional. And where your attention goes, energy flows. And they inadvertently become evil by this pursuit of following evil. When you constantly search for evil, that's what happens. And a lot of these channelers are just channeling satellites. And when you seek for purity, you'll, it'll just show in your countenance. And in your attempts to impress others because you'll be a living example. So a lot of these people, and especially the New Age, make up their own conceptual design of this world, what they think it is, instead of leaning on scripture to find the truths in all things. So they're getting kind of strung along the way and deceiving themselves in, in their journey and believing that all paths lead to God. There's only one, and there always has only been one. Most of these times, they don't really have the true foundation of things. And if you don't have that and the creator of this realm, then you're going to have limited answers and limited solutions for things. And a lot of the New Age theology, which I've gotten out of, it goes in circles, just like Wiccan or Pagan things do. Because the NWO agenda is the New Age agenda, the Age of Deception spells it out, like Ganj Shamira put out. Its aim is to replace the one true God with other versions of him, to profane his name, to invalidate him, or take, take Jehovah out of the equation entirely with some pseudo-scientific explanation of causality and happenstance in these terrestrial time frames, when really the celestial operates outside of time and space and doesn't adhere to our faulty calendars or conclusions. So I guess what I'm trying to say is without Christ we have nothing, and with Christ we can do all things. And that is a time-tested truth that will always stand. Having the eye of this world is nothing in comparison to having the eye of Jehovah. And that is real truth. He watches us like grasshoppers, he says. He's concerned with us. He cares for us. He knows us, each individually. Everyone and everything in your life without a filter is like taking a, a cursed, sketchy statue into your house, even though you know you shouldn't, and you open the door to attacks then. The spiritual realm is all about authority, and every transgression of the law strips us away from spiritual fortitude, wholeness, and peace. We can't pick and choose how we love God or how we hold back part of ourselves and think we can ignore what he has to say and face no consequences of it. Proverbs 7.2 talks about this. The more that you recognize Yahweh's authority, the more authority you have in Yahweh to exercise. Otherwise, we're just like Simon the Magician, or just saying a name. I name it, I claim it, snake oil, and think we can just manifest anything we want. People don't recognize Yeshua anymore. They want something that makes them feel good, gives them what they want, a white European Cesare Borgia Jesus, when it that's not even what he was. <clears throat> what they should be thinking is what do I need to get rid of? What do I need to lay down at the cross? What can I give to you, not what can I get? Jesus gave everything we had and he expects us to give everything we had have. The knowledge that comes from heaven in this world doesn't want those who have no love for it. They, want, they won't be found in the kingdom, these people that have these ideals, but they remain in the valley of the shadow of death. Mainstream Christianity who makes it 
will be considered the least in the kingdom, I think. And I'm not condemning, but I'm glad that people are even seeking or, or worshiping at all. But those who go for years and don't even know his name, they wouldn't even recognize him if he came to their church. Or they wouldn't even know it. People who think they know better refuse to say his name. It's probably because they're following the wrong one. We're supposed to be representatives of him on earth. And these foreign gods will lead you to your death. And you can empty your mind all you want and sit on a mountain for 20 years and call yourself holy. But if all you have to show for it is a long beard, then you're still living in a carnal mind. So what good does that do you? Nothing. That's not enlightenment. Yehovah is mindful, not mindless. He sees all. He knows all. He is all. And when you follow these other paths, you become a target. We need to meditate on him and his word and not ourselves. It's just like Catholic prayers that are Gnosticism. They, they bring you emptiness, not wholeness. You know, other countries made up their own festivals. Pagans appease their gods just to keep the gods away from them. But true Christianity does the opposite. We want God to be near us. God called us out of all that so that we could be holy, so that we could be set apart, so that we could come out of Egypt. Even on our money, we have the representation of Egypt. The same thing's been going on for the last 200 years. And it's sad because the true face of Christianity does not fit into this world. It's mirrored in the holiness of Yeshua himself, and his face doesn't fit in what the world presents him as. Man has an eager excuse to call God's word unholy. When it is God's word itself that spoke us into creation, the forms and the letters, it's not legalism. It spoke us into existence. It breathes life into us. The Lord says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, when they make a person that will pros proselytize in a twofold manner that will become more of a child of Gehenna than a missionary or a witness. We can't define even unto our own death what Jehovah fully is. He lives in eternity. Only he knows that. We can't define it for ourselves. He can just show us by ways of expressing himself through us, which is what him creating us was all about and putting his code inside of us. So when we quantumly entangle with him, we draw closer to him. And if we reject knowing him, it's probably because we have an issue with pride. People who really want to come into the fold are at a crux. And this is no time to be on the fence anymore. The door of grace is closing. And anyone searching, the first thing to break through is the Hegelian dialect and everything. The split that happened between the church after Christ left is sad because the Christians that think they had it right and then they go back to that land and then tell the Jews that the law was done away with and all these false cities only encourages them to reject Yeshua and wait for their Messiah still. On both of these sides, we know that there's pieces missing from these angles. And if you know something's missing, then you need to ask God what it is. And even Messianic Judaism took the seeds of corruption that were sown into Judaism itself and then incorporated them into the middle point, like a libertarian point of view, when you still don't have all of it and you still have incorporated the wrong things. So this continual Hegelian dialect that plays out in life is played with movie characters on the same side, products advertising false duality, 
politics especially like the head of the beast and the power system and the structure all comes from Lucifer it's the same thing but played out in two different as presented in two different things senators and governors are most in danger when they get to high levels because they can easily be taken over or replaced at that point so beyond this Hegelian dialect we know that Yehovah gave us a standard of righteousness that he wants his people to live in for their own good so that we can eventually obey his mitzvot, his commandments to be joyful and celebrate because he's a God that has a commandment to be joyful. There's no other gods like that on earth. And even though we'll never be perfect here when we understand a fuller part of the gospel, we need to exemplify that and at least gravitate toward the perfection of him minutely instead of becoming reprobates where we're full of sin and he can't be in the presence of us and then we don't understand why our lives suck so much we need to understand that we do need him and live the way that he intended us to be to be called and counted for And this world has a hard time seeing and feeling from Yeshua's perspective because it's a generation that worships themselves. And it's hard to see all these truths without having a disdain and a disgust and an intolerance for most humans. But with Yeshua, he tempers all of that in his teachings and in his wisdom to soften our hearts so that we can still have compassion, patience, and long-suffering and have the fellowship with our brothers and sisters that we do need still whoever and wherever we meet we still need to have this attitude we're lucky to have a God that cried with us we don't want to be the unfaithful bride that's talked about in Judges 9 that was an unnamed woman who was left outside the door all night the book of Enoch is the key to depicting flat earth these extra canonical books are they're actually just occluded canons the extra canonical ones were the Talmud and Kabbalistic writings the Babylonian writings that overlaid the word added on to it and then created bondage and confusion for the Jews with all the mixing and defacing of the gospel and Christ himself out there we just need to make good choices and utilize discernment but also to never get so engaged in our pursuit that we become a disappointment to others because spiritual forces work through others to get to you and sometimes healthy boundaries are necessary to abate spiritual lice and entrapments our bodies should be detoxed purified kosher laws should still be practiced because what was called food and kosher was what God had already ordained to be food and clean he even used the the, the animals that were sacrificed had two veins in them that didn't connect to the brain and the carotid, art, carotid artery it made a loop so that the animal didn't suffer when it was sacrificed there was no pain in the ritual itself and back then we didn't have any GMOs you know their diets were the same if they had a kosher diet and we didn't have all these other ecological and environmental toxins that give us cancer and all these things now so there's still wisdom in a kosher diet So we still have a lot to see in this Edenic restoration, the capstone of creation, not the fake eye of Horus, pyramidical completion, which is just a fractal, partial tesseract anyways. Yggdrasil and all the ancient maps had it more right than we do now from our scientists. Sheol is a remnant of the tree of life. The trees of paradise are there still that hollow earth was mistook for. Yeshua himself said that paradise, he talked about paradise, not heaven. 
even on the cross. Now I've had MK experiences where there is a hole in the middle of an Arctic place where I believe that the North and the South Pole meet and it's the same and we'd take magnetic white pods and go down into these lines in the earth. So God's concave domed flat earth has always been the reality. And it was actually the waters of heaven that poured down to flood the earth. There is going to be a time where the sea will be no more and the sea will give up its dead. There will be a time coming when the pit is opened and that will become the lake of fire. This is a time to call the elect out, to call everybody in this world out of Egypt. And it's a time for the Exodus to return to Eden. The Shemitah Yovel, the Lord's calendar, the reenactment of Jacob and Esau in Israel, the return of God's time, his seasons, his moons that the Edomites stole and replaced and collaborated with Rome to change the whole world. The eighth year, all is the Lord's. Trust in the Lord. Let penitent confession of sin and prayer for cleansing and pardon predominate. Make minute and grateful mention of God's mercies to you and your fellow men. Let your prayers abound in thanksgiving and praise. Dwell on the spiritual death, the fearful danger of relatives, neighbors, acquaintances, and the necessities of a world lying in wickedness. Let fervent intercessions in behalf of all those go up to Hashem from your heart. While praying for a world buried in sin, don't forget to ask that Christ's earthly church may be composed solely of pious members and be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Let your heart be so filled with the sense of God's majesty, wisdom, rectitude, and goodness that adoration will constitute the chief staple of your prayer. Let the fire of God burn within you. Let it be with his mouth and his teachings to direct you of what to say. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy and sisters, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what's God, what God's will really is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. Be made new in the attitude of your minds. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It exposes the inner, our innermost thoughts and desires. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1.6 have confidence in your new life. It will be richly rewarded. If you confess, repent, he is faithful and just and will forgive you and purify you from all unrighteousness. The Lord doesn't look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Seek after eternal things to thrive in God's house. To say, I love your sanctuary, Lord, the place where your glorious presence dwells. This is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. God's provision is here in the abundance of his house. Blessed are those who dwell in his house, filled with the good things of his house.
The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They'll grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They'll flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in an old age. They'll stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just one grain. It never becomes more, but lives by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. So was the first fruits of the resurrection. Let's forward and know that we can experience his divine power and receive everything we need for life and godliness. We're spirit beings who have a soul and live in a body. We feed our physical bodies each day to feel so that they can stay strong and healthy. In the same way, we need to feed our spirits each day with God's word. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Surrender. Praise his name with dancing. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Fast. Be generous. Serve. Use your abilities to help each other, passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. The Holy Spirit has a mind. Romans 8.27 He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things to bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. John 14:15 If you love me keep my commandments I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you I will not leave you orphans I will come to you You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. Each person should use whatever gift he's received to serve others, administering God's grace in its various forms. John 13.15 Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Whoever wants to become great among you, you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Galatians 6, nine. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. You need to persevere, so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5 Philippians 4 8 Do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not things to curse. Put into practice what you learned from me, what you heard and saw and realized. Do that, and God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Romans 12:11. Proverbs 132, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. The best is yet to come. God's called us to thrive in life. And there's many things in store for us, not just surviving here. Life can get better and better, and you can get stronger because God's leading you, and you've committed to become all that he wants you to become. When you feel like giving up, don't. Remember 1 Corinthians 1, 8. He will keep you strong until the very end.
La Hitriot.